Okay. All set? Yeah. Great. Okay, folks, welcome. Uh, we are very fortunate to have today to have Richard Parada joining us. Richard is a Wagner alumnus uh, and a, um, an accomplished jazz drummer and band leader. He also dabbles in movies occasionally. Uh, but, uh, so Richard started off his career, well, he'll, t he'll take you through it, but he, he uh, has an extraordinary list of credits, um, starting off as, as a location scout and a locations manager, working on some classic New York films, including um, Big and Working Girl, and then uh, working as a production manager on Donnie Brasco, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies, Made in Manhattan, Across the Universe, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, Doctor Strange, and is now the executive producer of Joker, which you may have heard of, and Martin Scorsese's uh, upcoming The Irishman. So we are very happy to have him here uh, talking about his work in the film industry and his, his, his path that led him here. Uh, so let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Do you want to start off by telling us how, uh, how this, your, your career developed? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, you know, when you, when you talk about some of the movies that I've done, you didn't mention, which is fine, I mean, you didn't mention, the first one I did was Desperately Seeking Susan. And I think back of all the films that I've done, and it, and it really means to me, that's how I'm getting to be real old. That's, that's really what it means, because it goes back to 84. And it's, you know, I don't know where the time went, because it wasn't, it was only 10 years prior to 84 that I graduated from Wagner College. You know, and film was not in the, on the horizon. I was, you know, I was going to go to, I was either going to go to law school or I was going to be a musician. Mm -hmm. And much to the chagrin of my father, I decided to be a musician, which, you know, so, and he was a judge. So he felt that that was So he judged you. He, he <laughs> judged me. He sure did, yes. So anyway, um, so I moved to New York and I was playing music uh, uh, from 70. I graduated in 73, so in 75 I was playing music until 84, and as a musician, even though I was playing and I was doing some recording and I was doing some traveling, I really wasn't making enough money to be, to be comfortable. Like I could get by, but I just saw that if I wanted to get married, if I wanted to have kids, which I subsequently did, that I was going to probably have to do something else. And when I lived in New York, I had a real nice loft in New York. It was right off of Fifth Avenue on 16th Street. And the rent was like $275 a month. And it was, you know, 1,400 square feet. You know, I mean, it was like crazy, right? And, and I lived there and I had sessions there. But I didn't have enough money to, to air condition the place. So in, in, the, in the summer months, and I was on the fifth floor, it got hot. So I would go to the movie theaters. And I would go see the double features that were being offered at Cinema Village or St. Mark Cinema or Theater 80 or the Thalia. These are all movie houses that I think have since closed down, although Cinema Village might still be there. And they would have all these double features. You could see Hitchcock features for a week. You could see like 21 movies in a week. Or you could see Preston Sturgis. Or you could see John Huston. You could see all these, these filmmakers. And... Um, so I would go like from two in the afternoon till seven in the evening when it was the hottest part of the day. So I was always interested in film, um, but I would come back and do the music. But at a certain point, I just got so drugged with the whole thing. I don't mean I was doing drugs. I just meant that I was just tired of it. And um, uh, a friend of mine was a uh, location manager or production manager with Woody Allen. And we were close friends. We were playing sports together. And um, I said, you know, I'd like, to get into the, I'd like to get into the film business. And he said, well, you know about film? I said, you know, nothing, really. I know. I know I like going to the movies. I always loved movies. And I always thought I had pretty good taste in movies. Um, so he said, well, maybe something will come up. And I kept hounding him. I didn't stop. And that's something to remember, by the way. Because I'm going to assume that most of you in this class want to be involved in film in some way, shape, or form. Is that 
Is that probably an accurate? Many of them, for sure. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to give you this advice up front, maybe the most important advice I can give you. You got to have perseverance. You really have to push. You really have to, you, you have to be a nuisance almost because there's so many people out there that want to do what you want to do. And in a way, it's such a privilege to be able to do it, even though you've worked very hard when you're doing it. But so you have to be persistent. So I kept asking him if, you know, if there was an opening. And finally, there, became, there came an opening. He used to work a lot with Woody Allen. And in, in New York City in the mid-80s, late 70s, 80s, Woody Allen was one of the, the constants of film in New York. There was always a Woody Allen film. Once a year, Woody Allen would do a movie whether it was Zelig or Han and Her Sisters or Manhattan or Radio Days, whatever it was, Woody was making a movie. So I got a movie on, they said, this, this, we're doing a movie with this young musician. You probably have never heard of her, but we think we got it. It's a good script. And it was Madonna. And I said, oh, I think I have heard of her because she used to play, because I was a musician, so the parallel life, she was... She used to play at Danceteria in some clubs in New York. So I had heard something about her. So anyway, that, that was the first film that I did. That was 1984. And, and when it ended, I was a location scout PA. And I remember I was, I was making $40 a day. That's a lot of money. It wasn't a lot of money at all. But back then it was okay. And I remember they gave me money for my car because I was scouting and everything. And, and when, the, when it ended, first of all, the first day we, we had to shoot, I didn't know anything about filming at all, what, what it entailed. I had scouted the movie, and we had prepped the movie, and we had done all our location lists and directions to places and set up all our holding areas and done, every, you know, done our due diligence for what is required for a movie to shoot, whether it's in New York, the locations. I was in the location department. That's kind of the, the first group in. And they said, okay, you know, we're getting ready and we're gearing up. And I could feel the energy building towards day one of shooting. But I had no idea what day one of shooting was. I, I mean, I didn't know what that was other than, you know, we were going to go out and we were going to film. Um, so. I remember being in the office and the energy level was high and people were frantic running around getting the call sheets out and costume guys running around, where's this guy, you know, all this stuff, and loading the trucks and getting everything ready. And I was kind of watching it. It was like, you know, it was cool. I didn't know anything. So um, I remember my boss, the location manager, said to me, uh, we've, our first day of shooting is going to be on 2nd Avenue and 7th Street and right down in East Village because it took place there, Susan Seidelman chose that as the, the, the iconic location for the movie. And uh, the location manager said, I'll see you there at 4 a.m. <laughs> and I said, what? 4 a.m.? You know, I, I mean, I mean, really, I mean, I was incredulous. I, 4 a.m., really? We got to go there that early in the morning? And I remember getting up and going, and I, I saw some of my musician friends going home from the clubs that they had been working at. And I was kind of like hiding myself because I was embarrassed first that I wasn't playing music anymore because there was such a pride in that. But also to see them go, I'm going to work at early in the morning. And anyway, you know, the movie was a huge success. I got through the movie and when it ended, I said to my wife, I had just gotten married in, in 83, I said to my wife, I'll never do that again. <laughs> I'm done. I said, I'll never do that. That was crazy. She said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I really don't know what I'm going to do. I said, but I didn't want to play music anymore. I just didn't feel that urge to play the music because it wasn't as gratifying to me at the time, whether I was burnt out on it or what, for whatever reason. So I remember, and by the way, this is a long story, right, to tell you how I got started in the film business. Sorry. So. Uh, I remember I was home, it was a Monday night, and I was watching Monday Night Football. And I had some friends over and I got a phone call. And somebody said, hi, this is uh, Frank Jones, whoever it was. He said, we heard your, your work on Desperately Seeking Susan, and we need somebody to go out and scout some locations. And I went, oh. And I said, well, and I didn't, 
I didn't know what to say. I really didn't know what to say. And I said, well, what's it pay? And they told me what it paid. It was like $25 a day more. I was, let's say I was making $50 a day. It was $75 a day. And I said, and, and a car, I get a car rental too. And they said, yeah. And I said, okay. I said, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. It was only a two-week gig. It was a TV show. It was called The Equalizer. Which was on TV. It was one of the first time, you know, like Law and Order. It was the early, it was the inception of those type of TV shows. So I worked on it for a couple of weeks, and it was all right. You know, it was fine. And then I got a call from Woody Allen's people saying we're doing radio days. Do you want to do it? And I said, geez, I don't know. What's it pay? And he said, well, it's it's a hundred dollars a day. <coughs> and I said, oh, well, a hundred dollars a day, yeah. Now we're going back. Remember, so $100 back in 1984 is probably what, $1,200 now, something like that. So, you know, it was it was it was suitable. So I said, okay, I'll do it, and then I did it, and then I and, I, and that was a period movie, and I didn't like working on that. And then somebody said, we're doing Heartburn with Jack Nicholson. Do you want to do it? And I said, well, what's the pay? And they said it's $125, and I said, I'm in. <laughs> so the next thing I knew, I was in the Directors Guild. I applied to become a second aid. You have the Directors Guild, you can't get in as a location manager. You're either an AD or a director, first AD or stage manager. So I got in the Directors Guild, and my first movie on the director, in the Directors Guild was big with Tom Hanks and, and Penny Marshall. So that was my first introduction to Penny Marshall. Marshall. So I did, I did big as a location manager. And now I had responsibility. I wasn't working for, some, look, we're all working for somebody. As an executive producer on The Irishman and on The Joker, I'm working for somebody. I mean, people say, well, you're the boss. You know, you can do whatever, whatever you want. You're, you know, yeah, I'm in charge of a lot of people. But there's always somebody above me that's like doing that. Too, so you're never you're never the boss, right? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who the boss is. There is no boss, really. <laughs> don't ever go to that place because you'll be, you know, it'll be a rude awakenings. Um, and if you think you are, you're not. And if you think you are, you're thinking wrong anyway because it's a collaborative thing. So anyway, but but I had more responsibility. That's the point. So with the responsibility, I felt more worthy. And, and, and more satisfied and gratified going to work because I was in charge of a group that was at the, we, you know, we set the stage for everybody. So I became a, a location manager and then I worked on that and I worked on Working Girl, which was with Harrison Ford and started a relationship with Mike Nichols, uh, who was a great guy. Um, and, and then, you know, did a, a few more movies. The next thing I know, I got a call uh, to be a production manager, which is a step up, and that was a very scary place to go because, you know, like when I first started in the film business, I didn't really know a lot, but they eased me into it, and I learned, and I asked a lot of questions. And that's another thing. Don't ever be afraid to ask questions, really. I mean, people say there's no stupid questions. Well, there are there's some stupid questions, okay, but 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 you ask them anyway. It's okay. Because if, if you're working with somebody that's got any compassion at all, they'll give you the answer. And you need the answers to your questions because it's the only way you can learn. The only way you can learn is to fail, but, but you don't want to fail on a big stage. That's why you ask a lot of questions. So you ask the questions and you, you make your mistakes. And I became a production manager on Donnie Brasco, which was a great movie and, and great working with Johnny Depp and with Al Pacino, who I've worked with since, obviously, in the in the Irishman, um, and, and then in 2000, so I was a production manager for a while, you know, I did Last Action Hero with Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was hot, and, uh, <laughs> you know, before he was the governor, and, and, um, and, and then the next thing you know, it was, it was 2000, now it's 16 years in the business, and I'm in it now, I mean, there's no turning back, I'm, I'm in the business, I'm doing well. And I started a relationship with Sony Pictures and with Revolution Films, which no longer exists. But their first movie 
was Black Hawk Down, which was a real good movie. If you haven't seen it, you should see Black Hawk Down. That's a real good picture. But that was their first movie, and they were going to make movies like that. So I loved being involved with them. And a friend of mine was the, the head of the studio who I had known through you know, just different acquaintances. So I became a co-producer. It was the first time I moved up, became co-producer, production manager to co-producer on Made in Manhattan and Mona Lisa Smile, and again with Penny on, on uh, Riding in Cars with Boys. And I did that, and then I was a co-producer on, on Across the Universe. A number of you have seen that picture probably, about, you know, with the Beatles, Julie Taymor. And I did co-producing on five Spider-Man movies. Well, I really wasn't a co-producer because they, they only shot the New York portion in New York. Obviously, that's kind of a stupid statement. They only shot what was needed for the movie that was take place in New York. In New York, the rest of the movie took place either in Atlanta for the later ones or California. So I did five or six of those. And then I became an executive producer. And I've executive produced like five pictures, the last two being The Joker, which, by the way, the number one grossing film of all time for an R-rated movie. Pretty interesting. So, and I mean, yeah, I don't take any much credit for for it, but it's you know, it's an amazing. It's an amazing job of acting by Joaquin Phoenix. Anybody seen it yet? Have you seen it? You know, pretty good. I mean, I, I, I think it's a real good movie. I like it a lot. And it's like, it's intense and it's violent, but I don't think it's gratuitous violence. And I think that the newspapers reported on it prior to really even seeing it based on word of mouth. And, they, and, and obviously they didn't hurt the picture. You know, it's up to $871 million. I mean, it's astounding. Uh, uh, by the way, I don't get any of that money. All right, no, zero of it. I don't share profit share. I'm not high enough on the food chain to do that. So you know, so no matter how. And I tell my musician friends when we go out and play a gig, because musicians don't make a lot of money. They'll say, "Oh man, I, I give them some. I have some gigs coming up. Oh wow, 871 million. This gig's going to play pay okay." I say, "I got nothing to do with it. Zero. You're still not going to get paid a lot of money." <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, so there's that now. The Irishman is coming out, which is coming out on Friday uh, for three weeks at a select theater near you. And then, uh, then it's going to go to Netflix. And that's a pretty amazing movie, too. It's just three and a half hours long. So, you know, don't drink a lot of water before you go <laughs> to the movie. Because and see it in the theaters, don't wait for And, and see, it, see it in the theaters. It's, it's definitely worth seeing in the theaters. You know, you know, I mean, see it anyway. Don't see it on your phone, you know, whenever that can happen. You know, I mean, that, that to me is something else. That's a whole different story that you can, we can talk about. Anyway, that's kind of where I started, where I came from. Stopped playing music for 33 years. Just stopped, really. I had my drums in the basement, and, you know, I would play. My kids would play, fool around. I have three kids. And two of them are in film, by the way, screenwriting. So... Um, so I stopped playing, and then three years ago, at the end of a Spider-Man movie, I think it was Homecoming, I don't even know the names of them anymore, um, uh, I got, had the opportunity to play music at this club, which was at Kaufman Astoria Film Studios. They had a, 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 a restaurant downstairs that was part of the commissary from the 20s with Rudolph Valentino and the Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields and... Uh, uh, May West, and so all these old star, old ancient stars from the past used to eat there. That was their commissary. So they had a club, so I started playing there a lot. So in the last three years, besides there and other places, I've revived my music career. So I've played like over 100 gigs in the last three years and done some traveling, and, and I just did a CD, and I'm going to do another one. So at the moment, I'm kind of I'm kind of caught in the middle you know, I'm getting calls to do movies and I'm turning them down because I just want to play music right now. I made movies for a long time. So I, I don't know the next time you possibly would hear of, of me, which I don't know why you would other than if I came 
and you flunked the course and you had to take it again and I came back. <laughs> so, I, but, but if you followed, I, I don't know where you'll, where you'll see me, whether you would see me you know, on, a, on a stage playing music or you know, on a movie set. So that's it, that's where I am. Anyway. I think some, some of our students know what, uh, what a production manager does versus what a co-producer or executive producer does. Mm -hmm. some, some, some of these folks definitely don't. Do you mind running through that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Great, yeah. So, you know, there are many, there are many levels of, by, by the way, what is the title of this class? This is actually not one specific class. These are just random. It was oh, this random. Student body, okay, so okay. Some film students, some non-film students. So it's, 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 okay. it's a good mix. All right, fine, fine. Okay, so um, the, the, film, the film crew is made up of many different people, different components. There's... There's the, the director, there's the studio that puts up the money. By the way, as an executive producer or as a co-producer, I don't put up any money. I don't, it's none, of, none of it is my money. I don't, that's not what I do. I manage the money that comes from the top. There's a perfect room. Look at this. This is the triangle. You can start at the top. It's like the food chart here. Anyway, so, so at the top is the studio, and they give you the money. And they give the director, they tell the director, you know, they're going to want to do a movie for, you know, whatever, 50 million. I'm going to do another long answer here to cover the whole thing. So you've got $50 million to make a movie. And when you read in the paper what a movie costs to make, they're never right. Okay? So don't even think of, the, you know, hey, The Irishman cost $159 million to make. It cost $160 million to make. It didn't. I'm not going to tell you what it costs, <laughs> but it didn't cost that. It costs a different number. So, um, <laughs> so the uh, so the studio gives has a certain amount that they want to spend on the movie because they've marketed it and they think that that's what it will bring in to justify it. Obviously, they're wrong in the Joker because the budget of the Joker was like it was like you know it was between sixty and seventy million dollars. Okay, so. Um, the director then has to assemble a, a crew, and he first he says, I think we should shoot this movie in New York, and that might influence who his producer might be. So Marty Scorsese was going to be the producer, one of the producers on Joker originally, but he backed out because he got too busy with editing The Irishman, plus the movie was very violent, and I don't know if he wanted to be associated, even though Marty's done some violent movies. I mean, Irishman and everything. But, the original script was pretty violent on, on the Joker. If you've seen the movie, it was more violent than that. He, he went more rogue than that in the original one. So he decided that because Marty was kind of involved that he would <coughs> get the team that did The Irishman. So Emma Koskoff, who is, who's Marty's producer, has been for years, decided, you know, he decided he really wanted her to do the movie. And I work with her. So I had to meet him, and, and he took a liking to me, Todd Phillips, who did the Hangover movies. And we had a real nice first meeting, and we joked. He's a real funny guy, okay? He's a very funny guy. There's another side to him, too. But the funny side is the good side. That's the side you want to be around. Anyway, so we had a good meeting. So I became the executive producer. Line producer is a better term for that because line producer, I'm, I'm responsible for the bottom line. I'm responsible for making sure that that movie comes in at the number that they want us to make it for, or the number that we finally <coughs> decide it needs to be made as we, an agreement is made. We keep working on budgets, we keep working with the director, we keep working with this, the first AD, and we come up with a number, and it's going to cost this, and then they hire Robert De Niro. Well, Robert De Niro costs more money than Joe Schmo, so now you've got to give us an extra couple of million dollars because Robert De Niro makes more money, so the budget <coughs> fluctuates. So, so when we, we knew we were going to make this movie, I had to hire a production manager. Okay, So I hired a woman that had worked with me on on the Irishman that used to be a location manager like me. It's like, you know, everything kind of flows in a certain direction. So I hired her. So the difference between what she does and what I do is as a production manager, she's responsible for making all the, for making most of the deals with the crew, the grips, the electrics, the camera people, 
the, the Teamsters, the Scenics, the location people. <coughs> She's really in charge of making those deals. I'll be responsible for making the cinematographer's deal with the studio, making sure all the actors, the, the director decides he has casting sessions, but I have to make sure that their deals are done and that you know, every, the, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed with the actors. She deals with that. She, we discuss everything together, but she does that. She signs all the paperwork. She signs most of the checks. I can co-sign a lot of the checks. But I'm more associated with and more closely aligned with the director and the creative producer because on a daily basis he might say to me, I need an extra day because we can't, we're never going to finish. It started pouring and, <clears throat> and we need sunlight and the sun mysteriously just went away and, and we can't finish the scene so I'm going to need that and what's that going to cost me? So I'll say it's probably going to cost you an extra $200,000 but I'll call my location, my production manager and she'll start running the numbers. What's it gonna to cost to go back to the location? Well, the location costs you $40,000 for the day. So you know it's gonna cost that. The extras, you gotta pay the actors, you gotta pay the extras. So the, the difference between the two jobs is I can do both jobs. The production manager probably can't do the producing, line producer's job as well, but they will be at some point. But I've already done their job. So their job is more paperwork, checking the budget every day, making sure that we're on, 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 on budget with the input of me and me feeding her information like we're going to have to return this location, call the location manager and make sure. So it's a very similar job. They're very similar. One just gets you closer to the talent and to the director. Executive producer could sometimes be an amorphous title too, because you're obviously a very hands-on. Yeah, I'm you're, more. You're I'm a nuts and bolts guy. Some executive yeah. producers have that title, but they might just be. There are five. Something and they're writing the check. Yeah. Or there are five executive producers on. On Irishman. Mm -hmm. I. I saw one of them, come to this. I saw two of them. They came to the set. They flew in on their jets or whatever. And they, they hung out on the set and talked to Marty. How you doing, Marty? Marty, good, okay, great, good. I just get away from me, you know. I mean, they're there. They're there because they either optioned the script, the the, the book. So in order to do it, they're going to trade maybe a hundred thousand dollars to get a title as the executive producer. They're an executive producer because they've worked with. De Niro and they manage De Niro so they become executive producers so some of them are like they're kind of hand-me-down jobs and and they get the title and and I, I would be I'd be a liar if I didn't tell you that it's offensive to me sometimes to see who I'm associated with on the credits because I know what they did on the movie that's not to say that they didn't contribute in some way beforehand but they weren't there making the movie. They weren't up at five in the morning and didn't go home at eight o'clock at night and didn't, you know, weren't in the trenches every day. You know, they came in when they wanted, they left when they wanted, and you know, and they picked up whatever they had the, their paycheck and moved on. So that's why I wish they would call us line producers because everybody knows that's what the line producer. You're an executive producer. Oh, great, you know. So you've worked with some great directors. You've worked uh -huh. with one of the all-time greats. You've worked with several brilliant. Extraordinary, right? like Mike Nichols, yeah. and Rainey, Drew the Tamer. <coughs> what your job is to say, sometimes say no to them, right? Sometimes, you, 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 I mean, you're trying to make what they want happen, but you also sometimes have to say no. Can you talk about the sort of tension between wanting to facilitate what they do, but also? Well, I'm not sure I ever said no to any of them, okay? I certainly never said no to Marty. That, that, that ain't gonna happen. You know, nobody says no to him. So maybe you can get on your knees and say maybe, <laughs> you know. But um, it's a de it's delicate. I mean, you can with certain people. I could say to Julie Tamer, Julie, I don't think we can do that. Uh, just, they're just not going to give us that. You know, can we figure out a different way 
to do this, can we approach it? Maybe we cut, maybe we cut this other sequence and we, and we do this. And if she says, no, I'm, I'm doing it. I say, well, I'll go back to the studio again and I'll ask them if we can do it, but I know what they're going to say. And she might say, all right, I have an idea. Or she might say, I don't care what they say. Find the money for me, figure it out. And I say, uh, okay. And then I go back to my trailer and I say, oh, fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> really? I guess, excuse my language. I said, really? I got to figure this one out? I, can't, I don't know how to do this. That's on tape too, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> good. Yeah. Great, wonderful. Um, so uh, it's, it's delicate. And, and you know, you never try to say no because the, most directors only ask for things that they really think they need. So if they really, really feel that it's necessary for them to have it, they're, they're kind of coming to you and, and you're their right hand man or woman. So you're there to help them. Now, that doesn't mean, and I'm serious when I say it, it doesn't mean that after they say that, I don't go back to the trailer and say to somebody in the trailer, like the, another producer who's there, usually there's a couple of us, I say, she's out of her mind. Does she really believe that we're going to be able to pull this off? And, you know, you have those conversations. But to her, it's we'll do whatever we want because she hired you to protect her, but the studio hired you to protect them. So you're kind of caught in the middle. So you need to be, you need to be really diplomatic and you need, to be, you need to be slick at times and you need to be duplicitous at times. But at the end of the day, they're paying you good money to figure these things out. And some things you can figure out and, and some things you can. And some directors will say, don't worry about it. We'll cut the scene. I promise you tomorrow we'll get out of here by... Four o'clock. Don't even think about it. It'll be fine. You know. So sometimes you get cooperation from people, and sometimes you don't. Some people are more cooperative. It's like life. Some people are more cooperative than other people. So you know, you just have to figure it out. Um, coming back to music, because I find it so interesting that music was your passion, and now you've happily gone back to it. Uh -huh. uh, but for all those years that you were primarily working in film and were leaving music entirely to the side, did you find some of the same? Did you find creative satisfaction, or was it the job didn't really? What the movies? In, yeah, like did you find some degree of? Well, as a location, as a location scout, there's a lot of satisfaction because you're going out and you're finding, locating a, a location that could turn out to be an iconic one for a movie, and when the movie comes on the screen, and you finally see it, you say, you know, you go to the movie with your your mother and father come to the movie or your brother comes to the movie or your friends and you go I found that location that one was mine and if there's a sense of pride to that um, so there's it, that's creative an accountant is not a, if that's not a creative position an accountant I don't care whether you're an accountant for the IRS if you're an accountant for Charles Schwab or you're an accountant for a movie it's numbers that's it that's what it is and if there's any accountants in here I mean, no offense. It's just what it is. That's that's what it is. But if you're a as a as a production manager, it's not really creative. It's not a creative position. It's more of a it's it's a business position. You know, you're balancing a budget. You're hiring people. You're making deals with people. You know, you say I want fifteen hundred dollars a week. I say I can give you. Thirteen hundred. You say, well, I don't want to do the movie for thirteen hundred, and, and uh, for thirteen hundred. And I say, but I can't pay you fifteen. So you know, we we try to work it out. If we can't work it out, then you know, if he has another movie, he's going to leave. If he doesn't have another movie, he loses. I win. So you know, but you try to be fair. But it's it's a negotiation. So business is really an important component to being a production manager and a producer. Um, Location is a little different. Director is entirely different. Um, speaking of which, whoever's a location scout who found that staircase in the Bronx for the Joker must yeah. feel a real sense of pride. There's thousands of people yeah, taking Yeah, the Shakespearean there. staircase. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's... He didn't find it necessarily. I mean, they built it a long time ago, so somebody... somebody <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like discovering America. Right? No, I, I, but, but, I, but, I, but I mean, I think people have shot on it before, but... They shot on it, and you might say, you know, 
what's a big deal? You know, I worked on a movie in 1997, and I, we shot on that staircase. Yeah, but you didn't shoot on the staircase where as many people have seen the movie, and Joaquin Phoenix is famous doing his thing. So, yes. But the director kind of found that. You know, he said, I want a long, here's what he said. He said, I want a staircase. I want a real, exhausting, long, high staircase because this man is beat up every day, and just to get home at the end of the day, he gets beat up again just to go home. So, you know, we know there's a couple of staircases in the Bronx just from years of being and filming. We know where those places are, so that's where we went. So, but yes, it's a famous st staircase now. Now, now it's so iconic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, folks, I'm happy to open up to, to questions. Yeah, I'll answer. I mean, ask me anything you want. I'm sure somebody's got some questions. Yes? What's the favorite project that you've worked on so far in your career? You know, I was asked that question earlier. Um, is she here? Where is she? Hi. Yeah. See, you're going to get this answer. So, um, you know, I've worked on, a, I've, I've been fortunate, lucky enough to work on a lot of good pictures. And um, I'm proud of, I'm proud of many of them. But the movie that probably was the most gratifying for me to work on, um, it was it was pr the hardest movie I think I ever did, and um, it was uh, Across the Universe, um, and and I and I thought it was a really good movie, a real good movie, and it didn't do as well as I would have liked it to have done, and it didn't do as well as I think it should have done. But there were reasons behind that, and marketing had a lot to do with that, and it's a whole long story. But that movie was probably the one that I'm most proud of, because I had to manage, and um, there were elements of acting, dance, music, from singer's standpoint, from, from bands, and then we had to go to Liverpool, and that was that was great going to Liverpool and, and shooting there, and um, so that movie. But there are a lot of movies that I worked on that I'm you know that I'm I'm really proud of as well. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. So if the movie travels, then like you just mentioned, like you would travel along with the movie to a place like Liverpool or to or with Japan. Um, well, as it as the executive producer, as the producer. I would certainly travel. Like an Irishman, which you haven't seen yet, um, unless you were at the premiere, which I don't think you were, but maybe you were. I don't they know. played at the festival. What's that? They played at a few screenings at the New York Film Festival. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. And they've had some screenings for it. So, you were there? Somebody said yes? Oh, wow. Well, what, what, when did you go? I went um, September 28th, the premiere at the New York Film Festival. Oh, how'd you get in? Um, I have a teacher who is like a member and he gives out tickets sometimes. Oh, you won the lottery there. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that was quite an event that night. Yeah, it was amazing. I really enjoyed the movie. Oh, good. Oh, good. Anyway. Oh, good. anyway. Um, so, um, on that movie, there were some scenes that took place in Miami. But the second unit, you, do you want to know what a second unit is or should I tell them what a second unit is? Okay. The first unit is the main unit. So Martin Scorsese directs the first unit. Todd Phillips directs the first unit. First unit goes out every day, 60 days. 60, we shot the, the Joker, I think, in 57 or 58 days. We shot The Irishman in 107 days. It was a lot longer movie. So when you shoot, when you shoot with, with Al or Joe Pesci, remind me to tell you something about Pesci when I'm done, musically, okay? Because I'll forget. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the director is going to be present whenever there's a cast member that is doing a scene, a cast member that is, that is of e even, even ones that only have a couple of lines. He's going to be there. He's really responsible for delivering that line and approving what that person says and how they say it. Um, but when a car gets blown up or, or a boat gets blown up or there's a, a shooting you know of a, of a character that's not a a day player um or, or a, a cast a cast member of the first unit or there's a, a pull-up of robert de niro 
driving down the strip in Miami, which isn't really Robert De Niro, it's a double, that gets handled by the second unit. There's a second unit director or a stunt coordinator <coughs> who acts as the director for the second unit. So they go out ahead or during or after and they shoot those scenes. And it doesn't, it almost never requires a real actor. There's a scene in Irishman, maybe you remember it, where Joseph Kennedy is sitting overlooking the bay down in Florida. It's before he dies. It's one about the Bay of Pigs. And I was just an actor sitting in a chair. He looked like Joseph Kennedy from the back. He was bald. He was about 80 years old. If you're too young to know who Joseph Kennedy was, but he was John F. Kennedy's father. Um, so, um, so they go down and shoot that. But when you have to travel and the director has to travel, I will travel. So we shot down in on Random Hearts, that was a movie I did, we were down in Miami. On Donnie Brasco, we were down in Miami and Fort Lauderdale. On, I, on, on uh, Across the Universe, we went to Liverpool. You know, different movies we traveled, different places. Um, I didn't, here's, I'm gonna answer your question again now. I didn't do a lot of traveling as a production manager or a location manager or as a producer because I was, I had carved out a kind of a niche for myself in New York City, one, and two, I was married, still am married, and had three kids, still have three kids, and I wanted to be home. I wanted to hang with them, because I, you know, I enjoyed my kids. You know, I, I guess you could say I love my kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to be with them. And they were involved in sports, you know, two of them were real good baseball players, played in college, and, and I didn't want to miss any of that. I didn't want to miss any of that. So I would go out of town maybe for a couple of months at the most. That would, that would you know, if a job went out of town, if I started a job and they said, we can't shoot it in New York, it's going to Oklahoma, I may have said, well, I'm, then find somebody else to do it. But going out of town for two, three weeks, I, I didn't have a problem. It wasn't like I was homesick. I just wanted to be there. Right? And I had a movie uh, about four years ago down in Atlanta, Lewis and Clark. It was an HBO movie. Um, and they were, it was a 120 day movie based on the book Undaunted Courage by Stephen Ambrose. Great book. Really good book. If you want to read about what it was like traveling in 1804, 1805, from St. Louis to the Pacific. Unbelievable what they went through. Next time you think you're having a rough day, think about what they went through, all right? Just, just think of the mosquitoes alone, that they had nothing to repel them from, and if there were swarms of them all over your head and you were in a boat and you couldn't get them, you're getting bitten all day. Anyway, there were some good parts in it that wouldn't make you feel that way. But anyway, so that movie was gonna shoot for 120 some days, and, it was shooting in Alberta and Atlanta. So I was gonna be in Atlanta shooting that movie. But my son was a senior in college. At that point, I knew I wasn't gonna miss baseball season. So I didn't mind doing the movie at the time. So it was, it was cool. Then they shut the movie down. They didn't like what they saw after 33 days and $33 million. HBO said, we can't, we can't do the movie. It's just, they were seeing dailies. You know what dailies are? Dailies are, if, if we were filming this today, which we are, and, and we had to cut it into the movie to make sure that the performance was worthy of, you know, can we use this? After you shoot it the next day, the end of the day, you watch the dailies of the takes that were the, that were the approved takes, the circled takes, they, you know, you might do, 10 takes of a scene, you might do 15 takes of a scene, you might be two t do two takes of a scene, depends. So whatever number of takes you do, they circle the ones that are the ones they wanna keep, and the next day the director will look at those takes. And so if, if there's something they don't like and it's really horrible, they may have to reshoot something. Anyway, uh, before I, where was I before I said that? I don't even know. Travel, traveling for work. Yeah, well. Anyway, I tried. There you go. Joe Pesci. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Joe Pesci. All right, now we're there. Anyway, I, th I think that answered the question. No, 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 I guess yeah, it yeah. did. So, um, 
So in, in terms of uh, what I was going to say about Joe, Joe Pesci is just like an anecdote. You might like this. So Joe Pesci arrives uh, uh, to do his first day, not a filming of getting wardrobe for the Irishman. And he didn't want to do the Irishman. He didn't want to do it. He turned it down like 10 times. He really did. He didn't want to do it. He's retired. He likes to play golf. And he's, and he's a real good singer in the vein of little Jimmy Scott. If you don't know who little Jimmy Scott is, you can Google little Jimmy Scott and you can see who Jim, little Jimmy Scott is. He's since passed, but he was a he was an African American singer, little guy, little Jimmy. That's that's why they called him little, um, and great singer. And Joe Pesci became very friendly with little Jimmy Scott, and he sings like him. And Joe has a, a when he sings, a lot of times he would call himself Joe Dogs, because he didn't want to be known as Joe Pesci because he felt when people go see him as Joe Pesci, they're there to see him say, "You talking to me?" You talking to me? You know what? You know. So he didn't want that because he wanted to be, and he was part of the. He was like one of the characters in the Jersey Boys. I don't know if you know that, but he was kind of put that band together because he's from Newark, and all those guys came together. Finally, they he moved out and got into film, but Joe was Joe was a singer, doo wop, and then uh, anyway, Google J little Jimmy Scott. And you'll see Joe will come up. So anyway, when I met Joe, I had been playing music now for about a year and a half. And I was playing right at a club. Our offices were in the stages where the, where the club was. So I'd play there on a Friday night or a Saturday night when we were working, and people would come and see me play from there and from other places that would just come to the place. So I met Joe at the, at the elevator. And uh, I said, excuse me, I said, I'm Richard Barada. I uh, just want to tell you, I'm an executive producer. Nice to meet you. And he went, ah, hey, you're the drummer, huh? And I went, yeah. I said, I am, yeah. He said, I heard you're okay. And I said, I, I, said, I guess so. I said, you know, well, and he went, ah, okay. And from that moment on, Joe and I, we only talked about music. That's all we talked about. And Joe came and sang three times with me. He sat in and sang which I have on tape that he said nobody's allowed to see. So I, it's not been put out, but I have him record, you know, singing some tunes. And Joe really, really loves to sing, you know, and he's got a couple of CDs. He's got a new one coming out. But film-wise, he's, he does, he could care less. He really could care less. Interesting. More questions? Yes? You talked a little bit about when you were first starting out, what, what like, what made you choose certain projects nowadays? What, 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 what's your thought process when you decide to uh, do a project? Is it the collaboration with, with the directors? Or? Uh, um, well, I, this question I answered before as well. Um, uh, not a here, someplace else. Um, when I first started out, New York City was not the hub of movie making that it is now. There was no tax incentive in New York State. You know, there's a 30% tax incentive now in lower New York State and in upper New York State. I think Albany might be the cutoff somewhere up there. It's 40%. <coughs> so if you shoot a movie in New York, you get 30% of your money back below the line, not above the line. So if I'm Leonardo DiCaprio and I make $20 million, let's say, okay? That doesn't qualify. There's no rebate. There's no tax incentive on above the line. Director, producer, actors, none of that is covered. But everything else is covered. So if, above the, if a movie costs $100 million and 30 of it is uh, above the line, so $70 million qualifies for 30%. So 30 times seven, two, 27 million dollars is, you know, the, is rebateable minus some things. If you don't do visual, you have to do the work here. So if you take visual effects, most of the visual effects houses, ICM, ILM, in the, are on the West Coast. They don't qualify because the work's not being done in New York State. 
But if the work is being done in New York State, there's a tax incentive. So now go back. So when I started, there was none of that. And New York City was a very expensive place to shoot. It still is a very expensive place to shoot, just like Boston is and LA is expensive. But New York is even more expensive. So um, there weren't that many movies being made in, in New York. You know, John Cassavetes was making movies in the, in the, in the 60s and Sidney Lumet was making movies in the, in the 60s and the 70s, and Marty Scorsese started making movies back then, and John Schlesinger made some movies here, but there, and Woody Allen. But there weren't that many people making movies in New York. So I didn't choose any movie. If, they, if I got asked to do a movie, I, I'm doing that movie. It could have been Freddie Wears a Hat Upside Down, I was gonna do the movie. It didn't matter, because I needed to work. So, uh, but I got called for some movies that actually were, were good movies. I mean, they weren't making stupid movies. Uh, that many, I mean, I didn't, they weren't making too many of those. So back then, I would get a call and it was, hey, Rich, do you want to work on, we're doing a Woody Allen movie. Yeah, let's do it. Hey, Rich, Mike Nichols is making a movie. Do you want to do it? Yeah, let's do it. Hey, Rich, there's a... They're, they're making this movie, uh, you know, whatever. But I don't think we should do it. It's, I don't, it's not long enough. It's, you know, it was like a collaborative thing. I wouldn't do it. Now, jump to now, what am I doing? You know, how do I decide what movies to make? Well, I'm more selective now. And right now, this minute, I'm not doing any movies. I mean, I've been called. I, mean, I don't want to do any movies right now. I want to play music. That's all I want to do. So I can't do both. It's, it wouldn't be fair to the, to the film, and it wouldn't be fair to the musicians because I want to be at the top of my game when I'm playing, and, I'm, and the quality of the music is too high. So, um, so I'm, not, I'm not entertaining that. But when I was entertaining it, I would get calls, and the team that I would work with would influence it as well, because it's a team. You know, if you're on a good team, if you're a basketball player, or you're a football player, or you're a baseball player, or even a golfer, you know, you're part of a team. And if the team's good, it's a great feeling. It's a real good feeling to be part of a, a team that, that succeeds. If you're on a team that's really bad and everybody's kind of not into it, it doesn't feel as good. You might have your individual performance that is superior, but, but you, know, you know, in sports, winning is the whole thing. So in movie making, you know, you want to have a good product. So when I have a good team that I've assembled and, and I have an opportunity to work with them, then that will influence my decision on what movie to make. So um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, if, you know, if it feels right, I'll do it. I'll entertain it. It's got to. It's got to feel right, and it's got to be the right. It's got to be the right director, or the right producer. Because I certainly, at this stage of my life, don't want to work with, you know, with any assholes. I mean, I mean, I just don't want to do that. That's not, you know, that's a subjective, you know. But I just don't want to work with those people. So, I, there was a time when I had to work with certain people that weren't. The, the best to work with. But now that's, that's important to me. Life's too short. Not for you guys and girls. You know, you're young. But for me, life's you too short. You have to short. work with assholes. You know? <laughs> What's that? I said they have to work with assholes for a while. Yeah, well, that's part of growing up. You know what I mean? You, out, you outgrow the assholes at some point. You hope you do. You <laughs> hope. You're lucky. Yeah. You know, you never know. You don't know. You know. Uh -huh. Anything else? Feel free. Yes. Uh, what are some of the films that inspired you? You say that louder, or somebody? Some of your favorite films that got you into the film oh, that, that I enjoyed yeah. watching. Yeah. Well, I loved my favorite films. Were like The Godfather is one of my favorite films. Probably a lot of your film favorite films. Um, On the Waterfront, you know, classic. Uh, Twelve Angry Men. Some of the. Preston Sturges films, some of the Alfred Hitchcock films, The Sting, Butch Cassidy.
foreign films, good Italian foreign, French Truffaut films, you know, um, well, you know, mostly the classics. Mm -hmm. I just, I was just up in Lake Placid at the film festival this past weekend. My son, who's 25, um, had a film that uh, was in the short category. He had two films, but they accepted the one that was in the short, and um, and he happened to come in fourth out of 48 films, so that was good. But uh, showing, they had different films showing in the five days that they had the festival. I was only up there for two days. And one of the movies that were, they were showing, they had a beautiful print of that I hadn't seen in a long time was The Great Escape with uh, Steve McQueen. And, and I realize these are people that, some people you might know and some people you might not know. That's a long time ago, you'd know. You know Steve McQueen is. So, uh, you know, and, and James Garner and you know, Charles Bronson. James Colburn, but it was a, a true story about escaping from the Germans in Stalag 13. Anyway, another great movie, you know, another real good movie. So there are the classic movies that, you know, that we all like, you know. I kind of hesitate to ask this question because it's a little gossipy, but you're sort of uniquely suited to answer it. Uh, this whole controversy about some of these great directors like Scorsese and Coppola being critical of the popularity of superhero films because they have I just read about of, that they're again kind of pushing today. out sort of more personal films out of out of mainstream cinema. Uh, Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. You want, me, great, to, you want me to yeah, share yeah, that yeah, with yeah, you? Please, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, well I mean you've done both. You've worked on both kinds of movies. Yes, I have. So, yeah. yeah, I mean I did Doctor Strange right. too, you know, which was that and and um, I agree with them. Yeah. You know, I mean I, I, also it's I didn't read the, I don't know exactly what he said. I mean, I know what he said, but it may have been a longer conversation. But I mean, it's what you're steeped in. I mean, if you really want escapism, and I think it really serves a purpose to see action heroes and people flying in the air and coming down and rescuing the world or not, the dystopia movies, if, if, if that's what you like, you know, that's fine, but the, it's not. It's not a. It's not a real craft. Of of, it's difficult directing, but it's more technical. It's a technical exercise. You know, you're shooting against a green screen. You're going to see somebody jump, and then they're going to paint everything in, and it's a visual effects movie. Whereas, you know, you're making you're making a movie that's a drama, which they're less and less of. It's real life. Like uh, Peel, what's his first name? Uh, Jordan, Jordan Peel. He makes great movies. I mean, those are those are some good movies. Um, you know, Moonlight. I mean, that's I mean that's so far from a from an action you know superhero movie. I think they have their place, but I think substance is really lacking in in society today. And I think it's important to get the to get the story and get. The, the, the feelings and the emotions of what people are going through in their real life. And that could be funny. It can be something that's funny. But it's, it's certainly not, at least in my lifetime, maybe in your lifetime, people are going to be flying around and, and, you know, and rescuing people. I don't know. They have those, the hoverboards or those skateboards. I mean, maybe you can do that. I don't know. You know, if you get armored up enough. But I just think it's important that that, that we face reality at, at some point and we don't run away and escape, you know. I mean, what's going on right now in the United States and in America? I mean, we're so, I mean, I don't want to get into a political discussion, but I mean, we're, we're, we're such at odds. People are at such at odds. I mean, it's obvious. To me, it's obvious why. But, but you know, I think it's, it's just important for for reality to set in. So I, I agree with it. I, I agree with them. I don't mean you shouldn't make those movies. You can make them, and they're making a lot of money. I just wish people were more focused on things of, of substance. And, and, you know, and I know the, I worked with the guy that runs Marvel Studios, you know, not, not Kevin Feig, but this guy Lou D'Esposito. And, uh, you know, he's a great guy, and he's you know, and I worked on a movie with him. We worked on a movie down in, in, in North Carolina. Um, and, you know, he's made those kind of movies, but they're riding high right now. They're making, I mean, you, they got boatloads of money coming in for these movies. And you're all to blame.
Or somebody would be like. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying this just to butter you up, but like what, one of the refreshing things about Joker was that it was, it very much stood out as a movie. It's like a real film that does not, that actually does not run away from real social problems, real emotional, psychological issues. Yeah, um, for sure. It's, it's a serious work, you know? Oh, it's, yeah. It's, uh, it's not tights and, you know. Yeah, I mean, when, when I would say to people, people say to me, well, what movie are you working on? And I'll say, I'm uh, doing The Joker. And then I'll go out to dinner with them maybe two weeks later and they'll say, what movie are you working on? And I say the same one I was working on two weeks ago because people, people don't listen either, by the way. It's another quality that I found lacking. But anyway, uh, uh, but that's, that's a side note. So um, that book, I would say to people and they'd say, oh, it's like a superhero. And I say, no, 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 it's got nothing, nothing. Joker's not... You know, he's not tethering himself to something and swooping down and getting in a fight with Batman. It's got nothing to do with it. There's a, it's a real disturbed person who's been beaten down and he's disenfranchised and he's, life is treated, has not been good to him, to, like it is to a lot of people. And as a society, are we responsible for that or not? I mean, that's a question. That's a broad question. So when you go see the movie, even though it's R-rated and even though some people are getting shot, um, you know, there are other... It brings up other issues, deeper meaning, and, and I think that's important. And, and hopefully, although I'm, I don't know if it was the intent of the director, but hopefully it'll shed some light on and maybe people will pay more attention to the mental health of people in this country. That's, I mean, you know, in the world. If, if, if it does that, then, it, then it's fine, you know, and it's good. But it's just not some... You know, movie where, hey, let's go out and, and, and you're probably all too young, except for a couple of you that are in here. Um, remember Death Wish? Anybody ever see Death Wish? Yeah, you did, you did, you did. Death, Charles Bronson was like, you know, he was, a, he was a, one of those tough guys that was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and uh, he was in The Great Escape. And uh, he was also in... It was also in a good movie that I really loved. I just thought of it. Just hard Times with James Colburn, who was in The Great, the great Escape. But I forgot where I was going to go with that. Death Wish and The Joker. Apparently. Oh, yeah. I mean, so The Death Wish came out in 1978, Eight. something like that. Okay. And, I mean, he just, he went out. His wife got killed, raped and killed, and his daughter was comatose from it. And he just went out and started killing some bad people on the street. I mean, he was just going out and killing people. And I don't remember, I mean, I was only 28 at the time, but I don't remember the backlash that, from that movie that the Joker received for a guy killing a quarter of the people that he killed and had reason possibly to do it. Mm. So it's like society has changed too. Yeah. You know, you got, oh my God, you know. And, and I think with all the internet and the media and everything, it, ex it exaggerates. Everybody's got an opinion. Right. So, but, but yes, what you said is true. Yeah. Yes? Um, you mentioned earlier about how uh, you didn't like working on period, on like period films early in your career. And I wanted to know how that, how period films differ from movies that take place now, especially as a location scout. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to correct you for a second. Mm -hmm. I never said I didn't like them. Right. I said it was a period film, and I never wanted to, it caused me not to want to go, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Period films are very difficult to work on. They're hard, because as a location department employer, employee, you have to be there first thing in the morning. And on a period movie, you know, you can't show up like this. You can show up like this, but wardrobe's got to put everybody through the works. And he's got to get in, you know, 1950s garb. Like Irishman was a period movie. Right. So people have to come in. They have to get in early. So if, if, you're, if you're shooting call, call time, they call it, is at 7 a.m. And, you know, you, you want to start filming at 7.30, camera, camera ready at 7.30. At 7 o'clock, now you've got to back it up. And if you have 150 extras... They've got to get 
And we're, you're, when you're working on a movie, you're a traveling circus. That's what you are. Not in a comical sense. You know, sometimes people say, oh, that's a circus. If this is like a circus, you move in, you move in with 20 trucks and campers. You know, you got to find, you have to have parking. It's all pre -day. You just don't show up and say, hey, we got to find some parking spots. That would never work if that's all figured out. So you go in, you park, and then they got to, um, you know, park the trucks. That takes a while. And then you got to get into the holding area where you're going to bring all that wardrobe so people can start going through the works. And the holding area has to hold 150 extras. So if it takes, if you have 150 extras and it takes X amount of minutes to get each extra ready, you do the math and you figure out that they have to, they have to get in at 4.30 in the morning because you stagger the call because you don't want to pay people if they're not going to, you're not going to bring 150 people at the same time. You're going to bring 50 in. And then 50 and 50 because it costs money. Every hour costs money. So you're managing your money. So you bring people in in intervals. So when you bring these people in, let's say the first group of people has got to be in at 4.30. That means that the location department has got to be there at 4 o'clock to open the place. And in the winter, make sure the heat's on. You know, because God forbid if the heat's not on and the union comes in and they say, you got to pay them extra money. There's no heat. you got to fight with them. So you don't want to go through all that. So you got to get in at 4 o'clock in the morning. So... On a regular movie, if it were not a period movie, you might get in at 6 o'clock in the morning. You'd say, holding area is there. They just have to look at them. They're going to put on some shirts. Nothing major. No hats. None of that stuff. So it differs in the respect that there's more detail. There's bringing in the cars from a certain era. So you got to get in and you got to make sure the cars can be placed in the streets. So there's so much more that takes place on a period film than on. So, do I like working on period films? For that reason, absolutely not. But if it's a really a great story, I don't mind it at all. Period films cost more money than a contemporary film because costumes cost more money. You have to go in the archives. You have to get them, bring them in people earlier. Those old cars, you've got to pay for those old cars. Those cars, you know, a normal car. If I, if you, if I was employing you, you were an extra, and I needed your car, you'd get $35 for your car. A period car, it's usually like from the 50s, they're, they're 750 dollars $850 a day you get for that car. You know, you work on a movie for 10 days, you're getting you know, $8,500 for, for that car. I mean, that's, that's a nice little payday, but that, that's what it costs. So I guess that answered your yeah. question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you've already given our students some great advice about, you know, how you go about bringing to the industry, but more generally, any thoughts on, as somebody who's, you know, got that fortune film yeah. and music, any thoughts about sort of how do you balance sort of, you know, the work that you love versus the work that pays the bills? Oh, well, you know, it's rare, it's really rare that you, the work that you do that pays the bills is the work that you love. I mean, you know, maybe you love what you do, and I hope you do. That would be great. And Patrick, maybe you love what you do too. I, I don't, you know, you know, that's, and that's good. But not, I don't think as soon as you come out of school, you're going to love what you do. If you, if you can get to that point that early, I kind of feel sorry for you <laughs> because you got there too quick and you didn't have to work for it. And, you know, all good things in life, you really have to work hard for. There's no, there's no free lunch. There's, you know, you, you see people and you, and you always think that these, these people, whoever these people are, have it better than you. And you really don't know what's going on and what they've had to go through to get to that point. So, you know, you think the grass is always greener on the other side. It, it's, it, sometimes it is, you know, some people are dealt a bad hand. But, um, you, you got to really, you, you really have to work hard to get to the point where you love what you do. And you may never get there. I, I loved making movies. And if you talk to my wife, she'll tell you I hated making movies. Because <laughs> I would come home and say, I can't, I, I, really, I got to go through this, you know? And, well, don't do it. Well, I got to do it. I got, you know, I got to pay three kids college tuition. That's not, that's not cheap. But there were days that I loved going to work. Now playing music is, I love playing music. I mean, I love 
getting up and performing and playing, you know, mostly jazz, Latin jazz music with great musicians. I love it. But, you know how much practice goes in to playing the three-hour gig that you play? So you're practicing three, four hours a day. I don't love practicing all the time, but I know I have to do that in order to get the, to, to be gratified in it. So I love, it's a means to an end. You know, I love getting my paycheck on Friday. Do I love everything about what it requires to get that paycheck? No. So I think it's important and I'll digress a little. I think it's important that no matter what you want to do, you know, whether you want to make films or whether you want to be a, an accountant or whether you want to go on to Wall Street or you want to be an entrepreneur or you want to be a chef or you, you want to be a, an athlete. I mean, you know, athletes is a whole different thing. The hours that you have to put in to be a good athlete is, I mean, it's astounding. How, you know, they're... You know, nobody's born with God-given talent to take you to th that level on anything. You know, you have to work hard to do it. So I would say you really be prepared for, be prepared for um, some disappointment along the way because there is disappointment. There's no doubt about it. But, but have the fortitude and have the, 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 the know up in your brain, know that in order to get to that level where it's, you're going to be more comfortable, you've got to work really hard and you've got to stay positive and you've got to keep pushing the envelope and don't take no for an answer and, and, and put the time in. Because, like I said before, nothing good comes easy. It just doesn't. I worked very hard in my life to get to where I am. I mean, real hard. And I'm proud of the fact that I worked really hard. And at times, I caught some good breaks and that's you know, I would like to think you catch a good break every once in a while, right? I mean, you know, even a, what is it? Even a blind squirrel finds an acorn once in a while. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, but but don't if you have if you have a passion to do something, if you really have a dream to do something, you go do it. I mean, you can do it. You really can. You just you just do it. I mean, don't think you're going to go you know, jump off a building and fly. That's not going to work. You're, you're not going to make it. But, it but, if, but if it's realistic, you just go for it and, and do it. And then you might love what you're doing. You'll certainly feel proud of yourself for doing it. That's for sure. So don't ever, don't ever take yourself, you know, for granted. Yes? So I don't know if you, like, would even connect with these people on a set, but how often do you see people of around our age, like younger people on a set, because I know it's really hard to now get your foot in the door, it's super competitive, but do you see like a lot of young PAs or like, assistants on the job? All the time, every day, absolutely, because you're not gonna find a PA my age. <laughs> I mean, we're not gonna do that, that's not happening. But PAs that come out of you know, come out of college, yes, they, they're PAs, they're gophers, they're going to do whatever they have to do, and I talk to them all the time. And it's part of the job, part of the job that I like, because it's so interesting for me to talk to people in their 20s, because it's, there's a whole different perspective on things. Sometimes I don't quite get it all the time, but, you know, I'm sure people, when I was 20, and people were my age, they didn't get it either, but it's great. And in music, it's the same way. I love playing music with people in their 20s because there's an energy there and there's a, there's a freshness to it. There's, the experience isn't there. But I see, to answer your question, I see kids your age all the time. Unless you just went through a de-aging process and you were really like 70. <laughs> yes? Um, what advice would you give your college self? You My college self? Yeah. Wow. What would you do differently? Hmm. The, hmm. You know, you don't get a chance to do that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, you don't. You do, you do what you did. You did what you did. He and, means what should he do? That's what he's asking. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know what he wants to do. I, I do whatever you want to do, but do it well. I would, I, the, the only, you know, I would say, you know, don't waste as much time as I wasted, but, but I didn't waste that much time. You know what I mean? I wasted time, you know, I mean, you know. 
don't smoke as much pot as I smoke. Well, <laughs> I mean, well why? I enjoy that, you know, so do I not want to do that? Um, uh, the, the th one thing that I, me personally that I regretted was I didn't study piano because piano would have been a great bass because I studied drums, so I can read drum music, but I can't compose because I, I played saxophone, I played a little flute, but I didn't play piano. And from the piano, everything comes. And I really, w and, and, and my wife will say, well, we'll study it now if you want. And, and, and she's right, I'm, I'm super busy right now, but I could study piano if I wanted. But I wish I had done that, but, here's the big but. If I had studied piano and I, learned how to compose, would I have quit the film, the, the, the music business to get into the film business or would I have been marginally better off and made enough money where I would have been a little bit comfortable but nowhere in the life that I have right now. So, you know, you go back, you want to mess around with time, you're gonna, there's going to be some things that are going to really throw you through a loop. So, I, I, I don't know. I just. You know something? The, 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 answer, the answer to the question, what to do? Just be, just have integrity and honesty, man. And then, and be guided by that. And if you're guided by that, wherever you go, you can look yourself in the mirror and know you went, to, at least you, you went on the right you know, path. Any other questions? All right, well, can't end on a better note than that. So. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. How many people, can I ask a question? Of course, you know, please. How many people in here are interested in pursuing some f form of film? Uh-huh, okay. A lot of you are not film majors, so you should talk to us at some point. Yes. <laughs> um, if, if you do, you know, if you do, go, and, and how many of you in this room take, or have taken Todd Price's class? You, are you taking it now? No, I took it last semester and this semester. Did you see me? Yes. Oh, you did? Okay. Um, sorry if I repeated anything. No, you're fine. Okay. Because um, I'm going to do his class in a couple of weeks. I have to come back and do it. Um, uh, if, you, if you get into film, when you get done and, and you know, with college and you want to work, just, just go. You, you, have to, you have to find somebody in the film business that's working on films that can get you on a set to, to get work as a PA. That's what you got to do. You got to go in there. You got to fight and claw, and you got to get on. And if you meet somebody, you know, you meet him, and 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 all of a sudden, you, you know, you guys hit it off, and he gets a lot of work. He's going to call you again. And there's so much work in New York right now. There's like 65 TV shows, and six or seven movies. There's so much work. They're always looking for new people. So if you really want to do it, you know, it's not easy. You're going to be working 14 hours a day. But the difference is. From when I started, when I started back in 1984, I got paid, I told you, like $50 a day. And I got paid $50 a day whether I worked 12 hours, because it was never less than that. In prep, it could have been. It was like 10 hours in prep. But when you started shooting, I'd be on the set for 15 hours. And I never got paid overtime. There was no overtime. But, you know, every once in a while, if the producer was a nice guy, he'd say, I'm going to throw you an extra half another day because you work 20 hours today. But today, with the, with the New York State labor laws, New Jersey labor laws, you have to get paid minimum wage and you have to get overtime after 12 hours. So you'll be making $1,000 a week just starting out because that's what they pay now. So good luck, guys. Yeah. Uh, They're going to follow the passion, by the way. Oh, are they are? So, yeah. I quit in school right now? <laughs> yeah. Bad move. So. Uh, uh, and, and, and you don't have to go to film school, by the way, in order to work in the, in, the, in the film business. I never went to film school. But things have changed. You do learn a lot from it. But um, anyway, if you can get on a set, you know, if you can get on. I usually recommend for students who want to get PA work going to the Mayor's, mayor's office, office website. Go so to the mayor's office anybody website. Anybody wants to find more, email me. And yeah, I'll or Travana is another one. There's a thing called Travana.com, and it lists every movie that's shooting in their office where they are. Mm -hmm. And you just go around with a resume and you say, "Can I just leave this? Can I leave this?" And and by the way, 
the, the, this will be the last thing I say. Um, if it's always better to talk to somebody than to leave something, don't be shy because you want to go in and sell yourself. If you leave something, it's just going to be left there. And it's just going to go in the, in the round file, the garbage can. Probably nobody's going to know who you are. Just go in there and say, I'm here. Let's go. I'm ready. You know, so there you go. All right.